Right to crap. Nobody, nowhere. Glad to be a waterman. <laughs> you Chesapeake born. Chesapeake born. Hey, you Chesapeake free. You Chesapeake bound. And flowing with ease. Chesapeake born. Chesapeake born. And bound to thee. Indeed I am. I'm Chesapeake free. Geographic Specials, made possible by a grant from the people at Chevron in support of public television. Join us as the journey continues. For the men and women of the United States Naval Academy, the Chesapeake is the birthplace of their careers as military officers. Midshipman Tony Landauer skippers the Academy's 68-foot racing yawl rattlesnake. The most popular varsity sport at Annapolis, sailing confronts the members of the team with nearly all of the challenges they will experience in the fleet. The ever-changing Chesapeake is a formidable mentor. We gained a lot. That was a good call, Tony. Three years on the Chesapeake have probably been three of the better years I've had. It's absolutely fantastic sailing on this water. You can't compare it to a lake. On the bay, I've learned quite a bit of weather. I've learned tides. Never seen a tide before until I got here. I've learned currents. That's something I didn't see too much of in the Great Lakes and how to play that. And probably the biggest thing I've learned is how to race a big boat and organize a crew. Previously, it was all small boats, one man, two men. Now I'm working with 16, and I have to learn how to work with them and work them to make them uh, race as a unit. The midshipmen are heirs to a maritime tradition that began on the Chesapeake in 1607. In the 18th and 19th centuries, men fought for freedom here. Today, the bay faces a different crisis. Located on North America's eastern seaboard, the bay appears to be a peaceful place. Yet it is the scene of ongoing tension between the forces of nature and the deeds of man. Relatively young, the bay is still perceptibly settling its geologic destiny. With tidal regularity, its rivers and the sea skirmish for dominion over its waters. Heated by summer sun, 
chilled by winter wind. It's an arena of continuous conflict. The largest estuary in the United States and one of the most biologically bountiful systems in the world, the Chesapeake has long attracted people to its fertile waters. Its name is derived from an American Indian word, meaning Great Shellfish Bay. Members of Captain John Smith's 1608 expedition wrote of fish so thick that we attempted to catch them with a frying pan. One remarkable characteristic of an estuary is its ability to refresh itself. Man's encroachment on the shorelines of the Chesapeake and its tributaries is severely straining this natural mechanism. The bay is being overwhelmed. Yet the Chesapeake embraces realms of unsurpassed tranquility and natural beauty. Abundant with creatures of the water and of the air, its open reaches provide inspiration and a site for contemplation of one's place in the scheme of things. For the commercial waterman who fished the Chesapeake, the vitality of the bay is a matter of survival. Jennings Evans has followed the water for 30 years. With his boat and line of wire mesh pots, Jennings catches the savory Atlantic bluegrass. It's a skill learned over a lifetime and passed from father to son. Putting it matter of factly, Nobody knows anything about a crab. Just about the time you think you've got him all lined up, <laughs> he disappears and leaves you cold. You think sometimes you can head him up. You pick up your pot and you chase him. And sometimes you might catch him as he's going on out, but then again, you may not. So he's a real genius in outwitting the crabber. He's a formidable opponent for any one of us. I don't care how long you've been in the business. You really never know the instincts of a crab. <laughs> got one of them. <laughs> Look at that moss, how it's got on the pot. There's a heat. You have what you call moss grows all over your pots. You have little black flies digging into your skin. Sea nettles. You get out there and you're working hard. And all of a sudden, sometimes a crab will actually pick up a stinger from that nettle. Uh, you see that stinger will hurt on the skin anywhere, almost like fire in the summertime when you're sweating and all. But in the eye, you can imagine the pain. For Jennings and his fellow crabbers, the hazards are not just physical, but economic as well. Each season, you never know what to expect. I know our, the past winter we had was uh, terribly financially. And each waterman, although he may have a rough season now, is always filled with hope for the next week or the next month or the next year. Nobody can predict the future, but uh, you know in your heart with good friends and good family that you've got a chance to make it. Home for Jennings, his family and friends, is tiny Smith Island, Maryland one of two inhabited offshore Chesapeake Islands. Smith's existence is entirely dependent on the produce of the bay around it. Crabs in the summer, oysters in the winter, fish whenever they can be caught. The bay gives, but not without exacting a price. Wind, waves, and winter ice slowly erode the island's shores and take their toll on its harbors. The people of Smith Island cling tenaciously to their way of life as they have for 300 years. The store is a focal point of island social life. Waterman Root Dyes opened this store to supplement his income from the water. It's a family business. Rook and his son begin work in their crab shanty around 3 a.m. Here, one of the Chesapeake's most sought after delicacies, the soft shell blue crab, is fished up from tanks called crab floats. To grow, a crab must periodically shed its hard shell. Crabs about to shed, called peelers, are caught in the bay and brought here. After shedding, the new skin is soft for a brief period and the crab may be eaten whole. Always a regional favorite, soft crabs are now shipped nationwide.
By dawn, Rook is on the way to the crabbing grounds for another load of peelers. Rook's boat is of a design unique to this part of the Chesapeake. Known as a scrape boat, it is built to work the shallow waters favored by the shedding crabs. I guess I've been a waterman ever since I was 10 years old, I guess. You know, fooling around with crab. And my father, I used to go with my father. Something that gets in your blood. There's a trick to it. You have to know uh, just when to go get soft crabs, and sometimes they're in holes and you can't get them, and you're dragging you scrape on the bottom. You go a certain tide and you can catch them. The submerged aquatic grasses provide shelter and a feeding ground for the crabs. One alarming symptom of the bay's problem is the rapid decline of these grasses. Like generations of islanders before him, Rook Jr. has followed his father on the water. I like to work with Dad. Sometimes we don't agree on everything, you know, he tries to tell me things, it's right. Sometimes I think I know more than he does and I don't, but we get along good. It's hard to learn crab scraping. Something if you don't concentrate at all the time and pay attention where you're at and what you're doing and where to go. And I still don't know nothing like these older fellas know, but I'm just picking a few things up from them. I just keep asking a lot of questions. That's the only way you can learn. When you're born and raised to a place all your life, it's just hard to get out of you. I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it for nothing in the world. The outside world has discovered the island's simple charm. A growing tourist business bolsters its economy and will forever change its way of life. A family-style meal at Francis Kitching's house has become a Smith Island tradition. Famous for her crab cakes and home cooking, Frances does it her way, or not at all. This is clam fritters. Oh, 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 oh. I will make them. Wonderful. I make too much for my <laughs> What you don't see, don't ask for. <laughs> Retired from the water, Francis's husband, Ernest, mends nets and crab scrape bags. It's an art known by only a handful of the island's men. I was born here on Smith Island in 1918. I was born two houses from where I live now. I learned to love people and I love to cook. So I built up my own business, and I'm still here until the taps runs off of the screws in my head. Yeah, when we were first married, a dollar bill looked as big as a bed quilt. He went away dredging. He stayed six weeks. When he come home, he had $12. That's when beefsteak was like 25 cents a pound. You didn't have loaf bread. You had to make your own bread. We had kerosene stoves. We had kerosene lamps. We had no running water, nothing like that. It was a big change, you better believe it. Mm, boy, oh boy. Things is not like it used to be. You take back there, if a man says, I'll do something, you could depend on his word. It was just the same as the Bible. It was that honest. You take a lot of the land around here was sold by the word of mouth. There were no deeds. And when it come time for the, they died out, the lawyer told me, he said, Ernest's going to have a lot of trouble on the island for people who sold their profit by a word of mouth because they had that much confidence in God. So you see this, how much change. Now you have to have a lawyer, and then you got to get a lawyer for him. <laughs> My most important thing in my life is to leave a good background behind and to let my children, my husband, my grandchildren know that my life was worth living for things that I have already done. This is Stu Jimmy's with Muddy Gravy. You better believe it's good. Boy, oh boy, Freem, you got it tonight. Yes, better boy. That looks good. 
bless her spirit. May it bring strength to her body. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I want to eat that fly in a minute. I'd like to get you. Just take these out with your hand. Two things I'd like to see us get back to. Honestness and religion like it used to be. That honesty covers a lot of territory. And religion covers the rest of it. Since early in the last century, when the Reverend Joshua Thomas brought Methodism to the island, the church has been the major civil and social force. On a bright September Sunday, the community of friends and relatives joins Francis and Ernest Kitching as they renew their wedding vows on the occasion of their 50th anniversary. Francis, will you continue to love, comfort, and honor Ernest? Will you keep him in sickness and in health, and remain faithful to him as long as you both shall live? I will. Ernest, will you continue to love, comfort, and honor Francis? Will you keep her in sickness and in health, and remain faithful to her as long as you both shall live? I will. My first date with Ernest was when I went to Sunday school. And coming home, this girl said to me, Ernest wants to walk you home. I said, I know the way. He don't have to walk me home. But they talked me into it, see, and I finally grabbed him. Chesapeake cast its spell on the handful of families who settled Tangier Island, Virginia, in the early 1700s. For the 800 descendants of those early settlers, the enchantment continues. Since before the American Revolution, the people of Tangier have taken sustenance from the rich resources of the bay around them. Now, Tangier men are concerned that the bay's decline is a threat to their self-sufficiency. As teacher and school principal, Harold G. Spike Wheatley has been responsible for the education of three generations of Tangier's children. Now retired from the school, Spike remains active in his church as a lay minister. That was good singing for those of us who are here, and it's a fire gathering tonight, Wednesday, stormy. You know, when you retire after 35 years, you're at a loss, usually. And I have been somewhat at a loss, especially the last week or so. But thank the Lord for uh, throwing me back to my old uh, vocation. Crab netting. I enjoy crab netting and I've had several fire days and that's taken the pressure off, so to speak. What is one? No. I haven't seen it. Well, they got the order about the coronet from me, Sad. 
Searching the shallows for the elusive crab, Spike improves visibility by sprinkling a little fish oil on the water to calm the surface. Well, I love to work on the water. It's there forever, wherever you look. You always see the horizon. It's a marvelous place to think in terms of your relationship to eternity. And here, on the bow of a boat, looking for crabs, you're alone, you have no interference, and you can think in terms of what life is really meaning to you, what it's all about. And I find that a very life-giving experience, really. You can sing and shout, you're interfering with no one, yet your expression to God is free and clear and enlarged in you. And that part of the crab netting process has really been beneficial to me. Of course, I think also of other things. I think of school. I can't help that. School is just starting again. And this is the first time in 35 years that I haven't opened those doors and greeted those children and teachers. And that is a part of me that probably will be vivid as long as I live. There's an aspect of living here on Tangier, I think, that most people probably wouldn't grasp, especially for young people. There's a freedom and liberty about children that you don't see in city children. They're around, they're playing, they're up and down the street from one end to the other. And there's something about this place as a child that I just wouldn't trade for anything, and especially at this season, the summertime. Drawn irresistibly to the creatures of the bay, the children of Tangier observe crab potters like Duke Marshall with a mixture of envy and respect. For the young men of Tangier, the urge to follow the water is fundamental. How many baskets did you catch today? No, I didn't know. People says it's dropping off. Is it? And you still got a month of it. Uh huh. And it's a, you still got a month of crab pot and it's already dropping off. Month? About two months. Well, two months and it's already dropping off. Who said that? Everybody's been saying. You gonna finish school? I don't like school. If they'd let me quit now, I'd be glad to cry a pot. I'd rather cry a pot all my life, like you're going to do. Because you, you didn't graduate. Yeah, I did. Now, you better graduate. If you don't, you'll be sore. Children here have a, have a marvelous freedom and liberty. Now, as they approach their teens, we must admit that there's a great encroachment from outside that's changing the whole atmosphere, the whole culture of this island. Television, transportation, communication, and the way you want to look at it is such now that there's no longer any barriers. The sea around us, even 30, 40 years past, was a magnificent barrier, both in keeping outside out and keeping those inside here. But today, kids in their teens, uh, they have fast boats, they have fast cars, and they go where they please. They may look at a basketball game in Philadelphia or New York this weekend, or they may look at entertainment at Scope in Norfolk uh, over the weekend, and they think nothing of it. When I was 16, 17 years old, that would have been a fantastic journey. So. There's a vast change in, 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 the, in the whole outlook today from my day. Well, when I like to have fun, I mean, I get off this island. I mean, you, you know, we have so much fun around here. I mean, because there ain't no bowers, there ain't no, no women that can stay out late or nothing. I mean, you know, everybody around here don't make a difference how, how old you are. I mean, if you're a girl and you got a boyfriend, you have to take him home to date him. I mean, you can't be out. It's the way it is around here. I guess it's the way it'll always be. 
so when I want to have fun, I just leave and go to Crestville or anywhere other than here. I like to get away. In the 1870s, Crisfield, Maryland was a seafood boomtown. Literally built on the shells of oysters harvested in the region, Crisfield now prides itself as the crab capital of the world. The crab industry annually contributes millions of dollars to the region's economy. Intense competition and seasonal fluctuations in crabs and market prices contribute to the waterman's fear that the business is faltering, that crabs may decline as did the oysters and fin fish, once shipped from Crisfield by the boxcar load. Picking crabs is tedious work, performed by skilled and experienced hands. Nimble fingers and sharp knives are gradually being replaced by modern machines. Still on the throne, within your bosom, you Grace Ward has been picking crabs for 15 years. Paid per pound of meat picked, she has found it a satisfying livelihood. I enjoy picking crabs. I enjoy what I'm doing. But for my children, I don't want them to have to, to de depend on us for their living. Because I came up a hard way. And uh, I, I want them to learn to pick crabs, shuck oysters, do all this kind of work because one day they might have come back to it. But I do want them to get the paper and the book, learn, and then I want them most of all to fear God and treat other people right. Oh, I thank you this morning, dear God. I just thank you for one more blessing. Thank you, Lord, that you might make me so I can be a blessing to someone else, dear God. Bless me, Lord, in a way that I can bless someone else. Then, Lord, I'm not just praying for myself this morning, but all of us need a blessing this morning. Ask you to let your word cut like a two-edged sword, Lord Jesus, whether we want to hear it or whether we don't want to hear it, Lord. Crisfield's annual National Hard Crab Derby is an end of summer ritual on the Lower Eastern Shore. The long hours and hard work of the crabbing season are nearing an end, and the festive atmosphere is a welcome respite from the grueling routine. Here we go, officially. The always competitive watermen test each other's nerve and skill in work boat races and docking contests. Okay, securing his bow line first. Yes, the boat guy has the starboard line. Oh! Ah! A highlight of the weekend is the crab picking contest. And this year's competition is particularly important to Grace Ward. Last year, I was in the crab picking contest, and uh, I got second place. So uh, I wasn't satisfied after they entered me in it this year. I said, well, I want first place. Then I began to pray, and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I'd just like to get the honor of getting first place this year. In a consummate test of manual dexterity, the contestants are given 15 minutes to pick as many pounds of crab meat as possible.
Brooklyn KCW Tall, 3.6600 pounds. First of all, we've been, we've had them on uh, the Jersey Shore at the beach every morning. We do take them out jogging. We, we, we give them a regime of uh, exercises. We've been feeding them steroids for the last eight weeks. And we fully intend to go home with the Governor's Cup today, the trophy. Traditional rivalries are stirred as the weekend's namesake event, the Hard Crab Derby, gets underway. Hey, we've got New Jersey and we've got uh, Virginia. Now we just have to find the Maryland entries. Anybody seen it? Do we I have a crab? So. I don't I, I, I think they might have heard the Maryland crabs haven't been running. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think they, were, they ran out on the, on the, the event. The Maryland crabs saw the destroyer and they left. They went home. <laughs> well, my crab, he really stayed under a flooring of a boat for five straight days and nights. Once this crab sees sunlight, he becomes mean and very aggressive. Very aggressive, with a lot of enthusiasm, and he'll run down that board just to catch that sunlight down there. And she's off, ladies and gentlemen. Uh-oh, the Guam crab went off the side. Number 12 is fighting number 17. Number 22, who is a Nevada crab, looks like it's in the lead and in a comfortable lead. Number 37 is moving a little bit on the left. Number 12 is moving good, though. Number 12 and number 13. Number 12 is the winner, ladies and gentlemen, from Kansas. The crab's name is Newark. Better, I better watch next year. Youthful anxiety mounts as contestants prepare for the Miss Crustacean beauty pageant. College Park, I had been studying um, computer science there on an academic program that I had been selected for. And last year's queen was the first black crustacean they had. So I entered it just in hopes of making a good showing, and I had never dreamed I'd win. But um, I just can't believe it's me being a beauty queen. I, I'm still shocked from it. The bay is not solely a place of work or recreation. It's a source of knowledge and inspiration for poet, artist, and folk singer, Tom Wisner. Tom enjoys sharing with children what the bay has taught him. You can see her real nice. She's real weak now. She doesn't have much life left to her. But you can see real nice that she's just like the nation's capital on the bottom. Right? Looks like the Capitol building. Right? And she's colored. See how her color is? She has a very red claws and a wonderful blue color underneath of her. See the female claw? How the female claw is nice and red. And here's the Jimmy here. This Jimmy is the Washington Monument. <laughs> Look. One of the things difficult for us is to make the connection with the earth. We have a lot of people that have um, studied it to death and try to teach about it that way. But it's, uh, it's the art of it that makes us feel it and know it that way. So the way I go at it for myself is I use everything I can get, like dance, song, drawings, photographs, whatever way I can get at her with some art in it. Chesapeake born. Chesapeake born. I'm Chesapeake free. Chesapeake free. And Chesapeake bound. Chesapeake bound. Flowing with ease. Chesapeake born, Chesapeake born, I'm bound to thee, bound to thee, indeed 
Indeed I am. Indeed I am. I'm Chesapeake free. Chesapeake free. She's the mother of the waters and the people of this land. Oh, the river children reach to take her by the hand. Flow through Maryland and Virginia to the sea. She's Atlantic born, Atlantic bound and free. I'm Chesapeake born, I'm Chesapeake free, I'm Chesapeake bound, I'm flowing with ease, Chesapeake born, bound to be, indeed I am, I'm Chesapeake free. To collect songs and stories, Tom Wisner travels to the small towns of the Chesapeake's Tidewaters. At Coles Point, Virginia, he visits his friend, Captain Watt Herbert. I look for people that have lived on the land close to the waters because it was the hope to find some lyric. And then in the process of trying to find lyric and story about the, the region, I discovered there's something more they give me. Um, it's just precious. It's, um, it's tempo, rhythm, um, feeling of unity with the place that comes in their being and bones, and they just give that to you just as easy as just sitting there and saying, hey. They may in the four peaks, feet watch Baltimore. I swear I'll never get Shanghai again down on the eastern shore. Salt fish for breakfast, cornbread twice a day. You're a lucky dredger if you never get your pay. Back out of then, they didn't, there was no law much, you know. You could go to Baltimore and you could Shanghai your crew over to the bar rooms and off of the streets and so on like that. Just, they'd go to the bar room and get uh, the bartender to slip a knock a shot into his drink, you know. And when he'd wake up, he'd be aboard of one of them bridge boats. And they'd bring him on down the bay and put him to work. And it was a rough life, at the best. Even if the captain was civilized, it was a rough life, say, on dredging was with them hand winders and so on. And uh, the wages was only about $12 a month. Well, he worked the crew for a couple of months and then to keep from paying him that twenty-four or twenty-five dollars that he owed him, he jibed the moon wanted him to knock him overboard to get rid of him. That's the story they told. I don't know whether it really happened or not. I've been overboard Lord knows how many times myself. But I don't remember anybody ever pushing me overboard. <laughs> Originally built as work boats, the swift Chesapeake log canoes were inspired by the Indians' spoon-ended dugouts. Nearly 100 years old, the island blossom is raced today by men who enjoy preserving a piece of the bay's maritime heritage. Doug Hanks has been racing canoes since 1930. I come from a competitive family. Everybody in the family wants to do something better than anybody else. We all have to win. Even now, I just don't like to sail. And if I'm out there, I'm looking around for somebody that I can go faster than he does. And uh, we're just that way, and we don't like to get licked. I don't believe she can handle this kind of weather. <laughs> She's awful tender, and a uh, little boat. Attention all log canoers. This afternoon's race will start at 1 p.m. Now, the wind's pretty high. You all be careful out there now, you hear? because, in my opinion, to sail them, it's far more interesting and demanding than those big boats with keels on, they can't capsize, and if the sail breaks, you just put another one up. 
But with a canoe, you got to get ready to start with, which is a major operation. Get out to the race, get through the race, get home, and I would say the last and least is whether you want to race or not. Pushed to the limit, the canoes are constantly on the verge of capsizing or sinking. For the canoes that do capsize, the race is over. Sails and rigging must be removed, the boat righted, towed to the shallows, and bailed out. As usual, Doug Hanks manages to keep his canoe upright and finish the race. State of John C. North, Doug Hank Skipper. We are successful. I've won over 700 races since I've been sailed. And uh, every year, even my crew said, Hanks, when are you going to give this up? You know, there's a limit. You've proven everything you can. I said, I'm not trying to prove anything. I just love to do it. I feel blessed to have been able to spend most of my life here on Chesapeake Bay enjoying the things that it offers, like sailing, hunting geese and ducks, catching fish and crabs. More than a million waterfowl winter on Chesapeake shores the throngs of geese and ducks are a source of delight to the bay's human residents. Some people hunt the birds, others enjoy just watching them. For everyone, the return of the geese is an exciting time, and involvement with them approaches a mania. The Waterfowl Festival in Easton, Maryland, is the site of the World Championship Goose Calling Contest. attracted to the bay's wetlands and open fields. If these areas are allowed to disappear under the pressures of human population, so will the birds. The bay's quiet waterways and sheltered harbors are also endangered. Modern marinas and shiny pleasure craft are replacing the small yards and wooden work boats. The bay permeates the lives of its people. Born during a frenzied northeast storm, Willis Harding is nicknamed Breezy. I was born and raised right here in this area. Uh, when I grew up here, it was almost pristine, sort of. It's, I mean, the, the sea grasses lined the shores. Uh, the water was clear. You could see 10 feet to the bottom. You could see fish and crabs uh, swimming around. As a young kid, it was... It was really a joy to be around here. We swam all day, we fished, we soft crabbed. It was uh, really a, a great place to grow up. It's a lot different, of course. You can't see bottom in two feet of water, and you got to fish awful hard to catch uh, half the fish you used to. Same with crabs and oysters. It's sort of a dying way of life, and I expect it to get worse before it gets better. The Chesapeake is an enormous sink. Everything that goes onto the land or into the water in its 64,000 square mile drainage area has the potential of ending up in it. Pesticides, agricultural runoff, industrial and household waste all contribute to the Bay's complex problems.
The Menhaden fishing industry has been biologically fortunate. The small fish the industry depends on for survival are abundant in the Chesapeake. When a school of Menhaden is spotted, the boats carrying the 1,500 foot long purse net are lowered. Permitted to fish the Virginia waters of the bay, the highly mechanized steamers can carry more than a million fish. Directed by spotters and aircraft, the purse boats speed to capture schools of Menhaden, which may number 300,000. Steady there, another little bit on your port. Try to bring you back to port. Steady there, steady. Already about seven, eight leagues there. As they near the tightly bunched fish, the boats separate and race to set the net around them. The men are constantly alert to each other's safety. The net weighs 4,000 pounds and flows out of the boat at breakneck speed. Time is of the essence because the fish may panic and break their tight formation. Directed by the spotter pilot, the purse boats quickly close the circle around the fish. When the net is joined, the circle is tight. A lead weight called a tom is dropped overboard to close the bottom of the purse. A hydraulic power block helps the men haul the net aboard the boats. Once done entirely by hand, it is still strenuous and dangerous work. Gone forever are the shantymen who sang out in sweet, strong voices as the nets were rhythmically pulled aboard. A few good sets will quickly fill the mothership and allow the men to return to port for a few hours with families. But for much of the six-month fishing season, the bay and the ship are their only home. Once bailed by hand, now the fish are pumped into the ship's refrigerated holds. But no technology can replace the fisherman's intuitive skill and knowledge gained over a lifetime. At the dock, the fish are pumped into the factory, where they are processed for their oil and fish meal. Seldom used as food by man, the fish are converted into materials used in manufacturing margarines, lubricants, paints, synthetic resins, and livestock and poultry feed. While the Manhattan industry has prospered, the oyster business has languished. In 1880, the Chesapeake produced nearly 120 million pounds of shucked oyster meat. By 1980, it had fallen to just over 20 million pounds. Stringently controlled by state laws, oystering is still very much a family enterprise. Mechanical or patent tongs are permitted in parts of the bay, but the bulk of the product still comes from the small hand-tonging operations of individual watermen. In Maryland, oyster dredging must be done under sail. This curiosity in the state's fishing laws preserves the only fleet of working sailboats in America, the Chesapeake Bay Skipjack. Ed Farley has been the captain and owner of the Skipjack Stanley Norman since 1975. It takes 100% of what you've got to, to make a living, and nothing less will do. Up until the last few years, a man, if he was willing to work hard, could make a decent living on the water. Now a man has to work probably a third more hours and a lot harder during those hours to make the same living. We're probably more at the mercy of the rest of the world than many people because we depend on the water quality sustaining our lifestyle and the water quality is totally in control of the industrial world and the farmers and the developers who are developing the shore waterfront. Oysters are a hardy species highly tolerant of the ever-changing natural conditions of the estuary. They are, however, immobile. Fixed in their homes on the bay bottom, they're unable to move to avoid disease, predators, or catastrophic changes in their environment. 
we did real well up until about four years ago, and we kind of felt that we had come to the bottom of a low cycle at that time because all of a sudden there was a lot of young oyster growth, and it looked like starting around last year, we should have started increasing the volume of oyster catch in the state of Maryland. And we had a lot of young oysters here, and we came out the first day, and they were all dead. There's nothing we can do about it that would be as immediate as it needs to be to, to solve the economic problems of the oyster industry. The crew of six share a percentage of the boat's earnings. Given a steady breeze, they should make expenses and a good profit. Early in the season, when oysters should be plentiful, this day's catch falls far below expectations. The general attitude of most of the watermen is that the problems we're having now is just a function of Mother Nature and what, and that, that Mother Nature will will uh, take care of it in the end, one way or the other, and that, that, uh, that God brought the oysters here and that, he, that God took them away. And I, I think that God brought the oysters here and that man took them away. And that not through over-harvesting, but through poor environmental controls. Aboard the research vessel Aquarius, Scientists from the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory are attempting to diagnose some of the bay's ills. Ecologist Walter Boynton has studied the bay for more than a dozen years. He is one of the hundreds of dedicated people in Maryland and Virginia working in concert to understand and better manage the Chesapeake Bay. Because of the bay's size and constantly changing condition, it's very difficult to generalize about it. One thing evident about the bay is that the quality and abundance of life are directly related to the quality of the water. Journalist H.L. Mencken termed the bay an immense protein factory. The bay has always had a lot of stuff in it. Today, the bay is threatened with an overload of proteins and pollutants alike. It's been thrown out of balance, and the man-made pressures on it are too great. The solution lies not solely in science and technology, but in human management and personal responsibility for the environment. Everything that is going to be done and is being done in the federal programs to help clean the bay and save the bay will be just too far in the future to have their effect and uh, may not, may probably not have the effect of improving the bay. It may stop it at the level that it's at now, but I'm not sure that it'll get it back to the, to the productivity that it really should be at. The machinery, the mudramism has destroyed it, I guess. I don't know what you call it. All this pollution, a lot of this is natural stuff. I mean, they'll come back, it always does. Chesapeake Bay is a great place to live. Um, I love it here, and so do a lot of other people, and that's, that's part of our problem. Who's Chesapeake Bay is? <laughs> it's your bay, it's my bay, it's your teacher's bay. What do you gotta do to it? You got it. You gotta take care of it. Chesapeake born, Chesapeake born, Chesapeake free. Chesapeake bound, Chesapeake bound, flowing with ease. Chesapeake born, bound to be. Indeed I am. I'm Chesapeake free. I'm the son of the rain. Brother of the wind, I follow on the water. Got tobacco on my chin. I've seen 40 years of sunshine when the rain. If I had a chance, I'd do it all again. Cause I'm Chesapeake born. Chesapeake born. That's Chesapeake free. Chesapeake free. It's Chesapeake bound. Flowing with ease, Chesapeake born, bound to be. Indeed I am, I'm Chesapeake free. Indeed I am, I'm 
the Chesapeake free. This program may be seen again this Sunday evening at 8. Stay with 11 now for the first part of a three-part series produced by WTTW, Campaigning on Cue. Thank you.